G'day, I'm Simon Barthold from www.bartholdbiomechanics.com and this is Langer UK TV. We're going to talk now about anterior knee pain um, and all the many things that can go on around the knee. Now we could probably talk for um, a long time about knee injuries and we probably need to have an orthopedic surgeon here to help out because there are a lot of things that can go on. I guess what you need to know about the knee um, is that there are, there are three basic joints around the kneecap. So we've got the femorotibial joint, so the joint between the femur and the tibia. We've got the patellofemoral joint, which is the joint between the, uh, the kneecap and the femur. And we've got the tibiofibular joint, which is the joint between the tibia and this quite delicate bone down the side of the leg called the fibula. Things can go wrong with all of those joints. Um, things can go wrong with the structures between these joints. The structures that we're dealing with mainly, we've got the, uh, the big structures inside the knee, the anterior and posterior cruciate ligament. We've got the medial and lateral collateral ligament. And we've actually got a brand new uh, ligament that's just been discovered called the ant anterolateral ligament, um, which in fact isn't new at all. It was described back in the 50s, but there's a lot of hoo-ha about it right now. Um, now I'm going to get Rosie to demonstrate something here for you, for those of you that are struggling a little bit to remember the anatomy of the uh, anterior cruciate anterior and posterior cruciate ligament. If you cross your fingers and put it on your knee, that's the alignment of the anterior and posterior cruciate ligament. So it's really easy to remember. So just a little tip there for you. Thanks, Rosie. Now we're not going to talk about major knee, knee derangement here. The only other comment I'd make is that the knee is a little bit susceptible because um, it, uh, it doesn't have the same complexity in terms of support structures as some of the other more major joints. It's very reliant on external muscles to provide stability, so the powerful quad muscles are very, very important to provide knee stability, to a lesser degree the hamstrings, but these muscles are basically um, quite important to hold the whole structure together, so we've got to really make sure that we understand any deficit in any of those muscles in terms of knee injury. That's particularly important in relation to the patella, and it's also particularly important what goes on more proximally. Um, so I'm going to explain that to you in just a moment. So I'm going to focus on the patellofemoral pain, uh, on patellofemoral joint, because that is by far the most common um, uh, common site of, of knee injury. This is sometimes called movie guy's knee, um, because people who uh, have their knee bent for a prolonged period of time often develop knee, uh, knee pain, pain behind the kneecap. Often if you're in a car, sitting in a car, driving for miles and miles, you can develop pain. Um, this is indicative that you're getting a compression of the patella on the, um, uh, the tibiofemoral joint. Um, that tends to create uh, inflammation behind the joint and around the joint. Uh, and this is uh, what creates the pain that we know as uh, uh, patellofemoral um, syndrome or patellofemoral dysfunction. There are a couple of other things that might play into the hands of this particular condition. First of all, the alignment of the kneecap is incredibly important. So the kneecap sits inside a little groove, it's called the trochlear groove in the femur. Um, and if the kneecap is displaced either laterally or medially, or it's tilted either laterally or medially, then certain facets of the, uh, the undersurface of the patella or the kneecap are subjected to more pressure, more wear and tear, and therefore they're more um, prone to become uh, inflamed. So patellofemoral pain we see more commonly in women than men, and we especially see it in um, late adolescent girls. So it's especially a problem in uh, female athletes around about 15, 16, where they've really sort of gone through that major growth spurt. Some of the structures are maybe tight, some are weak, um, and the kneecap's actually being compressed down on the joint. And those athletes are particularly susceptible to this. Many, many times I've seen very good female athletes, especially sprinters, who don't have the control up here. They fall into the hole, so they have this big valgus at their knee. The kneecap's being pulled across the joint at an angle, and it's just not tracking inside that groove properly, and they develop quite florid um, patellofemoral pain. So in terms of examination, what I like to do, um, just in terms of looking at alignment of the kneecap, there are a few little tricks you can do here. Um, I try to divide the kneecap into quadrants, so I try to look at um, maybe drawing a cross on the kneecap. Um, once you've done it a few million times, you don't need to draw on it, but if it will help you, by all means draw a line on there, and you've then got a grid. So you can actually look at moving the kneecap and seeing how far it moves in each direction. You can also get some assessment of what, whether it is tilted at all. The other very important thing is to determine whether it's sitting 
high on the knee, which is called patella alta, or whether it's sitting low on the knee, which is called patella baja. Um, so all of this alignment of the kneecap as a part of the syndrome is extremely important. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in how far it deviates in each direction, either laterally or medially, because this will give us an indication of how tight the structures are. Obviously, if it doesn't go very far laterally, it means the medial structures are tight. If it doesn't go very far medially, then the lateral structures are tight. Okay, and we'd be wanting to, uh, to work on those issues. Now, historically, there's been a lot of talk about the role of uh, vastus medialis obliquus, which is this muscle here, um, which does have a slip that inserts into the medial aspect of the patella. Um, there's been a lot of talk that if this muscle is weak, then you need to um, strengthen it to try to align the kneecap more medially. Um, I think that that theory has now pretty much gone out the window for a couple of reasons, not the least of which this is an incredibly difficult muscle to isolate and strengthen um, on its own. Um, what we now think uh, is far more important in terms of patellofemoral dysfunction is what's going on more proximally. So especially if you have got weakness in your glutes, which tends to make you fall into the hole in this direction. If you do that when you're standing, you're going to do it when you're walking and running, and that's going to very much alter the perspective of how the kneecap moves across the joint. So we tend to look at things like uh, what happens with a single leg squat? Can the athlete maintain the position of the patella over the foot or do they tend to fall into the hole? Um, we have a very strong focus on that in terms of our gait assessment, um, our gait studies. We look at what, what's actually happening uh, to the athlete, um, especially when they're in that single support phase of gait when the other leg is airborne and they're supporting weight on one leg only. Glutes are very, very important. Hip flexors are very important. Uh, because all these things control not only how far you might move into valgus, but also rotation of the leg. And all of these things unfortunately manifest at the level of the patellofemoral joint. More distally, um, for quite some time now, um, we've understood that there's a coupling between the foot and the leg, uh, so that as the foot rotates inwards uh, or pronates, there is an internal rotation of the tibia. Uh, if there's an internal rotation of the tibia, we have more potential for an alteration of timing at the level of the patellofemoral joint. So I don't want you to be thinking that there is a gross internal rotation of the leg and that that causes maltracking of the patella. I don't think that's a situation at all. I think what is occurring here is if, the, if we've got a foot that's pronating again at the wrong time, particularly in the propulsive phase of gait, then we've got uh, a whole sequence of events from the hip right to the foot that basically are uh, asynchronous. So in other words, we've got a weight-bearing leg, we've got swing phase occurring on this side. If the tibia is internally rotating on a pronated foot, then we've got muscles that are, that are firing out of sync. Um, they're not able to do their job in terms of stabilising the kneecap properly. Um, higher up, uh, the structures, we talked about the glutes, um, the, the, uh, the, the abductors and adductors of the hip are also uh, affected and so everything kind of falls into a hole there. In terms, of, uh, in terms of managing this, I think the current thoughts on managing this are very much focusing more proximally on what you can do to try to improve uh, recruitment. Rosie as an exercise scientist is an expert in this area so it's all about understanding which muscles are working and when they're working um, we shot an interesting video quite recently looking at how you might be able to extend your thigh either by using your hamstring or your glutes. Now obviously you don't really want to be using your hamstring to do that um, depending on, on the timing of the, uh, uh, of, of the gait cycle. You want to be using your glutes to do that. So if you're using the wrong muscle to achieve movement of a segment, well then that muscle is going to get overused and that's a problem. So we definitely want to be looking at what's going on at this level. Um, Mobilising the, knee, the kneecap is still quite important. I think if we identify areas of uh, any areas of tightness, we really want to be trying to, to make sure that we've moved that through, a, uh, through its proper range of motion or established that. Um, taping can be very, very important. For many years now, there's been a, uh, a staple taping that was invented by an Australian physiotherapist called Jenny McConnell. Um, it's a really great taping because it's so simple to apply. 
it addresses the issues that are present for the individual athlete, which I love. So in other words, if you've got a tilt on the patella, you'll tape it in a particular way. If you've got a, a deviation in one particular direction, you'll tape it in a particular way. So it really addresses the problems that are present in that athlete at that time. So McConnell taping, you can check it out online. It's very, very good. Um, maintaining joint range of motion, we've talked about, very, very important. Looking at what's happening distally, so we've talked about proximal structures, distal structures, we've talked about the rotational component. Um, okay, so we've talked about the importance of proximal structures, we've talked about the role of the foot in terms of when it moves, particularly when it pronates, which is a normal movement of the foot, and how that might influence internal tibial rotation. So if we can identify a fault at the level of the foot in the, uh, in the grand scheme of the gait cycle, in other words, if there is an issue that's occurring timing-wise, I would certainly look at trying to address that. Um, so I'd certainly look at um, uh, some sort of orthotic device, and uh, it probably doesn't matter whether we use a, a, a high-quality prefab like a bio-orthotic or we use a custom-built orthotic. Uh, we're going to get similar results. Um, I suppose the only difference uh, between the two is in terms of uh, how bespoke it is. In other words, if we really wanted to get down and titrate stresses very accurately, we probably need to go to a, a more custom-built type of device. But, you know, the high-quality prefabs like the bioorthotic are very effective um, and they can be great also as a, uh, a bit of a guideline to where you might want to go with future therapy. So once more, that's a bit of a snapshot. Um, about uh, anterior knee pain. We, we kind of glossed over the VMO a little bit. Um, I still think this is an important muscle. Rosie just pointed this out to me. Um, but it is difficult to isolate unless you've got a biofeedback machine. And I think the current thought is, rather than trying to focus on this relatively small, quite difficult to isolate muscle, why not do a global, um, a global quad rehab uh, program? And that's probably uh, a better way to go uh, as we understand it right now. Okay, so that's anterior knee pain. Hope you got some tips out of that. Let's move on to the next one.